Yo, how are you doing, folks? Welcome to episode nine of the Simple Life Podcast. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Market MC. How are you today, brother? Not too bad. Just to point out something to, to you, actually, there, just and derail this slightly right from the start. It's a fucking record. You keep calling me Maca MC. That's hilarious, right? I know I haven't, I haven't, I haven't picked you up on this, but it's actually <laughs> Maca Mac. Right? It's actually the start of my surname. <laughs> I'm not a fucking DJ or nothing like that. It, it, it comes, it comes up Maca MC. Um, when that's, that, that, that's enough of a, a thing for me. Maca Mac Itchy Beard. That's me today. So I hope everybody is less itchy than my face is. How about that? There you go. Be clean shaven, some quite happy. I'm sure our get, <laughs> guest guests today will have some bearded comments to make. Uh, we are joined on episode nine today by Chris Tasker, who is the founder and chief scientific officer. Yes, um, um, a that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> global cannabinoid solutions. Um, uh, a very interesting company that are going to be producing the Canna Manual, which is coming out soon. They do webinars and cannabis crash course, and they're a basic great resource uh, for everybody from the novice patient consumer all the way up to researchers, GP, and everybody in between. So without further ado, I'll throw you over to Chris to do a much better in, uh, version of an introduction. Oh no, thank you, Simple. That was wonderful. Very well done. And for number eight, it's spot on target there as well. Um, well, yeah, thank you for having me, guys. I'll do my best to be um, as on point with the science as ever and uh, any questions, things like that. My sort of specialty is uh, the endocannabinoid system uh, cannabis medical research, cannabinoids, THC, CBD, take your pick. Um, but now work with um, the cannabis industry and some of the sort of patient groups and try, we're trying our best now to work with a small team of scientists and growing team of scientists, should I say, to bring as much science to the UK cannabis conversation as we can and in as many sort of diverse forms as we can. So that could be education, it could be applied science and strategy. Problem solving, we'll do just about whatever we can to be as helpful as possible and uh, yeah, get out of the lab and make the science a bit more interesting. So it's a fun area of business and uh, lots of opportunities as well. And yeah, I always love you to talk about cannabis science and uh, answer questions and just have a good chin wag about the cannabis industry as well because there's not many people who know what I'm talking about for a lot of the time. So, so speaking of which, I'm going to interject again here on fire today, lads, I'm telling you. <laughs> You've tuned into the right show. Uh, <laughs> so for laymen then, for people that haven't a fucking clue what you've just said, what is an endocannabinoid system? Good question. So we've been playing around with some analogies uh, over this last couple of weeks um, because, yeah, it's not the most uh, digestible, visible bodily system uh, in as humans, but um, in, in essence... Uh, what we have is a sort of communication system that every cell in our body uses. And so um, that communis- communication system runs on endocannabinoids and similar to how we have a cardiovascular system that operates with blood. Um, we have a pancreatic system that regulates our blood sugar that operates sort of through insulin. What we've got here is an endocannabinoid system that runs on molecules very similar to those in cannabis and so that's basically our cardiovascular system but for cannabis and so um how i would describe it is almost like an email analogy if i'm a bit if businesses speak to one another and they'll send an email um, and they'll let each other know what's going on oh uh, we've had great business this week we're healthy we're doing well if you're not receiving signals, that's when people think, oh, well, what's up? There must be something wrong. Same goes for cells. And so cells communicating when they're not getting those endocannabinoid uh, communications between all these cells, um, we start to have breakdowns in bodily function. And um, basically because of that cellular nature of 
the endocannabinoid system. It's so small scale. Yeah. It impacts every tissue in the body. Um, and so just about any cellular function, any, any bodily function that's communicated through cellular communication, um, that basically regulates uh, your health and disease. And those would be the sort of emails uh, within the email chain. So it is a very complex, um, no, I appreciate you trying to dumb it down for us. But it's like a web of, <laughs> yeah, it's a web of just communication. Um, and again, I think because of how weird of a, um, topic it is to discuss, that's why, again, the sort of can of manual I thought was useful. Um, that's why we've been sort of so heavily set on all of the educational materials is because like, it, if you're trying to read this in words, it's impossible. But if you're looking at videos, pictures, and you've got a nice sort of multimedia um, arm to the educational stuff, it's far easier to, to digest. And um, there's some wonderful images online, some of them not so great, but basically imagine going from one email to each other, one communication to each other, to thousands of communications all the time the whole body is sort of communicating like an ant's nest almost and uh, the brain being the queen ant, all of these ants are talking to each other, sending sending different signals. And it really is, uh, I guess, a, a biological machine, um, the, we humans and yeah. the end of kind of annoyed system. So it has, uh, a, it had, it, it, sorry, it has a part in regulation then. Is that what you so said? yeah, <laughs> regulating just about anything. Um, all of the cells in the body, the trillions of cells in the body are all communicating either sort of with the ones next to each other, with the brain through sort of nerves. Um, and so that, yeah, regulation is basically um, happening between every cell and as a result, every sort of tissue. So your lungs, your blood vessels, um, your intestines, your joints, the bones. Um, and so that's why cannabis has such a broad range of effects is because those endocannabinoid system receptors and elements are in every tissue. And so depending on where the, I guess, the cannabinoids are being applied, uh, what the underlying deficiency or damage to the endocannabinoid system is, you'll get a different response in that person. And so it's very much like a fingerprint and looking at a, um, a communication fingerprint rather than sort of nice visible patterned one but it comes up in its own sort of chemical patterns as well so it is a very diverse system but again something that the medical curriculum hasn't even created a educational course for yet so mm. um all still in its infancy and um, i think it'll fill in a lot of gaps in mainstream medicine as well where we're not so sure why medicines are working they might be working yeah. through the endocannabinoid system and so um yeah it, it's the next cardiovascular system i guess but of of cells rather than um blood so yeah i was this thinking as you were talking about emails the way through wi-fi works quite well as a good sort of uh, of analogy in terms of because it is connectivity so the average person can really think of that although so i know you say with the emails with this different data that it's transmitting in sort of each thing but the overall system of it is like an internal wireless system because it's not in the same way as veins and networks and it doesn't yeah. so it's not as prominent it isn't something that we can go look we can cut a person up and here's the physical nature of it and i think that as you said causes a lot of confusion in the medical community of people who are like no here's the thing let me show it and then yeah. again as you mentioned the unique nature of each person's endocannabinoid system again makes it so hard to really pin any of this down um so i think what you're doing in terms of trying to create digestible resources for everybody is is an admirable thing because it's something that isn't in my opinion happening too much without bias in the industry as, as it stands there's a lot happening within the cbd industry but the nature of the studies are, are almost um, determining the outcome do you know what i mean that they're, they're true oh, they're, 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 do you know what i mean yeah. and, and the fragmentation of the um the different cannabinoids into different industries and for them to have to fight for different legislation and different regulation means that without people like yourself we're going to end up running decades down the line of explosion of industry but very fucking little actual education well i think that's probably what i'm seeing most commonly in the industry itself at the moment is a painful lack of knowledge 
a lot of money, a lot of products being sold, but they're all being sold to an uninformed consumer as well. So you've got the end patient, the consumer that has no idea how they're working. The regulator doesn't really have any idea how it's working. And then you've also got the sort of GPs caught in the middle. They're not really sure how to prescribe it. Is it even legal to prescribe it? Am I going to go to prison? Because again, they're busy people. They don't have time to be reading regulation and looking and like, educating themselves. Obviously, they do the best they can, but the average GP has got, I think, more, sees more than 100 patients a day. Where are you going to get time to factor that in? And mm. to do all of that academic reading to be able to prescribe medical cannabis. And so, and I hate that word medical cannabis as well. It's just cannabis. It's, it's all, I, I've slipped into the uh, language <laughs> black hole there. Um, <laughs> but again, without the education, it's not going to move anywhere. And that's basically what we're seeing now is a lot of companies have hit the wall because they basically the people will be purchasing their products. The people who are going to be connecting their products with the market have no knowledge, no training. And so everyone's guessing there's a lot of confusion and there's not a lot of alignment between all of those markets. And so that's where we've sort of slotted in is to help that transition um, in an evidence-based way and make sure you've got leading scientists solving those problems, not just people making it up as they go along. And so education being the sort of key point, but education right throughout, because again, consumers, public education, patients, how do you use it? How do I prescribe it? How do I dose it? There's a whole host of gaps that haven't really been filled yet. And um, yeah, it seems to be a heavy focus on producing products, but not really thinking about how we, well, now they've, now we've produced them, what do we do with them? And that's yeah. sort of where we've, we've got to now with cannabis industry. So still very early days, but tons that can be done. And again, a lot of uh, education is again, yeah, I mean, we so, all see the need for I guess. so something we've we've talked about on this uh, podcast quite a bit is the need for some sort of open source database that is completely accessible and transparent, and <clears throat> it's a pipe dream because people are so fucking resistant to that systematically. Um, do you know what I mean? I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if it will ever come to fruition. I would love to see it, and I think it could accelerate this process. For sure. Um, do you have any sort of opinion on that? Sort of an open source database? Well, um, it, there's a big separation between like the information that's been, like the research that's been done and what's been published and what's in the public view. So there's always going to be more information behind closed doors, depending on what company you're going to be working at. They'll be doing their own research that they don't necessarily want everyone to know about. And so there's always that financial interest in mm um sharing that information and making sure it is open source but that's why uh, i guess wikipedia and groups like that have done so well as well because the experts in those fields also want to make sure that information gets out and that's very much the same as well for the sort of cannabis research is that all of the scientists are there they're ready to talk they just need a platform and they need um i guess a, a stronger will from companies to be able to have a open dialogue where it's not just about those products it's about well how do we build something around that as well and not just yeah have our products at people and throw articles in the guardian or the telegraph or whatever it be and no. not really get <clears throat> past that um i guess language yeah. barrier the knowledge barrier and so yeah it, it's vital but um, again until i guess everyone gets their um, piece of turf or gets themselves situated those those uh yeah. patient-centric um sort of socially focused initiatives is sort of held back at the moment because everyone just wants to make money and mm -hmm. sell what they've got but again that's it's all sort of falling in on itself at the moment with that gap of knowledge so it's a, well, yeah i think that you mentioned it before the um the lack of education and the uninformed consumer because ultimately, the more informed the end user is, the end consumer, the smarter decisions they can make. If they then know not to fear cannabis, they're much more likely to spend money on it. But it, 
it is a thing is what I alluded to before of the industry as a whole that is making a lot of money and then directing a lot of research and directing a lot of um, political campaigns as well and reform groups to ensure that their product, their business model that they've created in between two slots of legislation doesn't get lost with the law change. Yeah. And I think that it's one of my biggest pet peeves at the minute is that there's people on the cover of Fortune magazine and shit and every other day in Bloomberg and many of the sort of sites that I follow online, I've got these articles about companies. I mean, you just saw um, Afrin and um, oh, right. Tilray merge uh, to yeah. create something like 3 billion um, assets. They're, they're going to they're yeah. control. Yeah, it's yeah. So they can they can do that. While at the same time, if you then click on UK cannabis, you see raid after raid after raid after raid after raid. You, you see people arrested. Yeah, and yet that that industry are currently lobbying our government and are currently the ones that are helping to guide certain influence so that it'll be those companies that then are the ones that first get to prescribe in the NHS, that first get to be the private products through the door, that first get to be in the now the recreational market that they're trying to push for. But it's not one that benefits the end user, really. We'll be able to access it more ubiquitously, but we'll still be criminalized for how much we grow, for what we do with it. And for, for, for the community that we have grown and protected for decades now. I think those are some of the biggest things that have resonated with me from since we've known each other, Simper, and sort of having had that grassroots induction. I came into it through the sort of patient communities, through the social clubs. And so um, I see what it means to patients and I see sort of what they go through as well. And that's something that we try to carry as much forward as well through... <laughs> A company was my way of solving that, but at scale within an industry. And so um, I've been very fortunate and that's how I can pay my bills. But at the same time, we don't want to be working on projects where we're just creating more of a problem because, again, we've got into this because we want to make sure, firstly, that the, scienti the scientists, sorry, the science is being correctly represented, but secondly, that that's being correctly utilised and is being sort of... Uh, it's having an effect in people's lives rather than just sort of being used to sell people more crap that they don't really know anything about. What we need to be doing is also like, a lot of our time spent educating the companies, not just solving problems for them and creating solutions, but also going, well, look, here's how we can actually engage with the community better. And that's basically what the industry is hitting now is that, well, we've sort of crashed the community. No one wants to work with us. We've, peppered everyone with sales materials and adverts no one really trusts us anymore um and we can't get repeat custom because there's a million other brands and so why are people going to keep coming back to you when there's three thousand plus sort of cbd companies at the moment mm -hmm. um and so again going back to patients everyone's overlooked patients and people in the communities all of the potential within that and they've just focused completely on getting out products and it, it's super easy that's why they've gone for it it's it, yeah it's easy to white label a product and it's easy to stick it on a website and just start selling it and spend a bit of money on seo spend a bit of money on adverts and there you go there's a free business model on how to set up a cbd company but <laughs> obviously there's a lot more that can go into it but that bare bones bread and butter right there mm -hmm. is where everyone starts and i said everyone maybe 80 percent, something like that yeah. Um, but again, going forward, now everyone's doing the same thing. How are you going to differentiate from that? How are you going to grow, mm -hmm. integrate into society? Um, and where are you going to get your longevity from? How are you going to be sustainable? Are you thinking about the social impact of all of this? Are you thinking about the quality of your product? How you can give back to the yeah. patients who are already skin or yeah. potentially facing prison time as well? And I, it's just, connecting people and building those communities again but i guess with the industry and going back to getting patients as involved in the industry as we can and consumers as well who um have pretty much zero representation at the moment so again podcasts mm. like this perfect opportunity for that open conversation where we're not trying to sell people anything here other than sort of i guess information and a interesting conversation yeah. but with that comes a lot of ammo and um, <clears throat> protection, I guess, from falling into some of these gaps. Because again, the number of patients I hear that have been sold a dodgy product, but didn't know it until yeah. it's not really done anything for them. I've spent hundreds of pounds on oil and yeah. someone sent me some olive oil, or I've ordered this stuff from America, or I've ordered this stuff from Spain. 
it's not worth spending your money on at this point just because there is so much risk there are companies that are reputable but but, but again finding those is very much a mm. sort of work in progress for people yeah. and i don't want to sit here and say who's the best but <laughs> yeah. certain groups that do it better than others and there's certain groups that will sell you the shirt off their grandma's back rather than just yeah. tell you the truth and say look i just don't know or this is here's yeah. the safe supply of what i'm as sure as i can be is cbd and here's the certificates here's the proof but again going back to how you can actually improve patients stop criminalizing them decriminalize it and then let people grow at home themselves and test it themselves as well like we don't need to be baby we don't need to be molly coddle that is the 21st century um and a lot of the modern world allows cannabis growth and uh cultivation so yeah it, it's unfortunate that i guess our legislation's maybe 20 years behind where reality is and again that lobby money obviously helps in keeping things certainly does. in certain directions and pointing yeah. governments in certain directions but again i think the more people that know about it the more more people that just like open conversations about it there's nothing to hide right. from well there shouldn't be anyway but yeah. um yeah. like if you've got nothing to hide i think and cannabis companies as well like you should be proud of what you do and if you're open and honest that reflects well and if you're there to help people rather than just sell them crap that also resonates and um again if it's clear that you're just selling products versus if you're actually there to try and help you'll you'll have a massive difference in website and approach and business yeah. plans things like that and um again it's all well worth discussing and again the more that we can arm sort of patients with that info the better yeah, we the informed consumer can make smart decisions, as we said before. But you mentioned um, about obviously the sheer number and scale of CBD companies in the UK. I think the vast majority of them are just looking at this in the same way the Bitcoin investors are. They're going, if I get in now, I can get out later and be better off. So a lot of them just want to start up, grab a small market share, wait for the conglomerates to come in and just buy them all up. And you're going to see what we see, we'll see with everything, with food. So we'll end up still with several hundred brands of CBD and tea and all the cannabinoids and all cannab cannabis preparations eventually. But they'll only be owned by a handful of people. I mean, white label in the UK, last time I looked at, uh, I spoke to somebody, one of the major expos, it's about four or five people. Yeah, that, that yeah. actually that actually control the top, and then it trickles down and it breaks and ever more. It's just it's it's a pyramid scheme, and the price it comes in at the top so fucking low that by the time it comes out at the end consumer, it, it's 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 insane. So it's crazy. painful. It's crazy, yeah. And again, like it, if people can grow at home themselves, I don't think that they would be buying any of that for the most part because it is so easy to grow. Really, it's, it's called weed for a reason. It yeah. does grow pretty. Yeah, no, no, I agree with you. But at the same time, like, you can brew your home beer at home, right? And I'm, yeah, not, exactly. I'm not doing any fucking damage to Heineken if I do that. They're fine. <laughs> do you know what I mean? They're going to, they're going to, they're not going to lose no, any sleep over it. You don't need but no, to... the difference with can cannabis is, or coffee or any of those things, the people that make coffee know more about coffee than we do. The people that make beer know more <laughs> about beer than we do. We know more about weed than they do. They've, they've for decades thrown the best minds and hearts of this community and the protectors of this industry in jail and allowed them to rot and get mental illness and, and degrade and lose themselves because of the fucking the machine of prohibition. And so then we're left with a lot of people that come from other industries, a lot of people that come from indirect experience. So then when they suddenly get spider mite at fucking week six of flour, or they suddenly have a powdery mildew, or they, they, they suddenly get a pH drop in, in water, they, they don't know what to do. So then there needs to be a system of social equity within this in any country, especially the UK as it emerges, mm. where these people are prioritized, they're put on a pedestal, their knowledge becomes, it's not even just a case that it's a gateway to industry making billions. It's a gateway to everybody having better knowledge mm. and better, better, better products. You know what I mean? To play devil's advocate there, right? Yeah. If you did there in delay, <clears throat> sorry, not play devil's advocate, play the fucking strategic opportunist cunt on the other side um, then surely dithering and delaying to a point where conglomerates can actually learn the same sort of techniques or uh, do you know what I mean that, that say 
people that within that have the known now would would be able to do so if you delay long enough they're going to learn they're going to catch up and then yeah. suddenly that takes the legs out from that argument doesn't it so, yeah which is partly of what i i believe they are doing i mean some people have been headhunted from criminality to move into industry you know i mean we've seen that quite a lot a lot more in i mean america um than than in the uk as of yet but again the the experience of people there are some people that is a one individual as a grower can pull down five thousand plants in a warehouse without nobody fucking knowing a thing yeah. and then there's, there's a guy with a team of 500 can't pull down yeah. a fucking a, a crop of a thousand do, do you know what i mean so mm. i think that the the invaluable nature of this still even when they come with with companies like chris's and others uh, base of education and knowledge there's still tricks that these people learned that the the, the illicit market will have learned. knowledge that you can't fabricate or synthesize mm. yeah uh synthetically there's yeah as you say tips and tricks as things that have been passed down generations that's why i think like, jamaica's been sort of pillaged by like, medical cannabis companies because they know they can get they we always talk about like seeds and land and things like that and genetics but we never talk about sort of like the nurturing skill that's required with it as well and I, the number of times i see say a, a cannabis cultivation um, project where oh we've got the best team we've got the best genetics the best plan you look at the team the last person used to grow tomatoes or something maybe or the it was a team of bankers and yeah. it's like a, taking a brain surgeon and making him do gut or pediatrics or something <laughs> they're gonna go mad yeah <laughs> And people don't realize it's not, it doesn't have that copy paste. And so we, I guess our job's sort of like blending that then and weaving that in with some more science, but it is a massive problem. And again, when you've got billions of pounds, hundreds of millions of pounds and massive geopolitical decisions being made, it's no wonder we are sort of where we are when it comes to policies and legislation. Mm -hmm. um, we, it, it's always miles behind, um, again, where science and society is, but uh, it's just a shame that uh, that, I guess, evolution and catch up to where the world is now mm. is just sort of being delayed still. And again, it's probably, it is definitely so, it's defensive tactics for some big international business plans that are very well funded. But <clears throat> again, it can all be done wonderfully well and with the right sort of, social impacts and with the right conversations there's so much everyone can learn from each other uh, and i think that's probably the key is that everyone's missing out on loads by being so insular and closed-minded yeah i couldn't agree more this is exactly why we started this project was to create a platform to have these conversations to show our similarity through our diversity and i think that has never been more apparent than within the the cannabis community which again is a very loose term these days because obviously we go back a few years, it was all of us. It was the hemp farmers. It was the, the medical advocacy groups. It was the, even the pharmaceutical companies to a certain and lesser degree, um, depending on which ones you're looking at. I shan't name names. Um, and then the, because of the way that uh, the evolution of policies went and because of the tactics of certain campaigns, we ended up with uh, a three pronged approach where agricultural went and, and sort of destigmatized itself from the dirty potheads from the people sat around smoking and it suddenly became this, oh, okay, we can listen to this and the history of its uses and all its potential yeah. applications. And so that went off and got funded and, and has now become far enough away that, oh, hemp's not cannabis, even though it fucking is. Um, and then on the other side of it, the CBD market kind of piggybacked on medical and they've, they've kind of pushed that way. And so then you've got people who are in companies that are CBD is good, THC is the bad thing. That's yeah. what makes hippies stab each other and jump out <laughs> the windows. Um, and so, yeah, and as they've advanced and they've got funding and they've sort of got ground, recreational, which is a loose term again that I hate, I hate any of yeah, these yeah. terms, but I'm it's using- all terminology, it. like- yeah. it it should it's all division, cannabis, shouldn't it? And it yeah, yeah, but if it, if it was, we wouldn't be sat here today because none yeah. of this would be relevant to speak of. <laughs> but until that day, this is why we fight for it. So my so my, my point is, because obviously you, I'm not accusing you as a business of, do, of doing this, um, but what do you know of, because obviously you work quite intimately within the business, is, 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 mm. is, 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 within the UK, um, of sort of the evolution of their ethos, of the, the philosophies within the company. Are there actually companies here who are looking for 
for the long-term good that don't just want the quick book and get out that actually are thinking, right, we need to consider packaging. We need to consider carbon footprint environment, you know, and all the way through to then um, creating new um, mm. application methods and all that. Are there those sort of companies actually flourishing or even just seeding within the UK at the minute? There's not so many companies. There's a small group and a small community of people that we sort of work with who we do see that from. And again, me being 25, I want to be working with people that want to be here in the long term, not just people who want to flip their businesses and skedaddle out of here because it, you can't properly um, structure yourself because it sort of you're pumping up the project to sell it for a higher price, but it's not necessarily reflected of the business. And so <clears throat> um, you're very right in what you say though about, um, I guess that difference in ethos and um, mentality and goals. Cause we obviously see a lot of short-term focused businesses, but also a lot of, I say a lot fewer people with a long-term focus and people that want to build and create something. A lot of people just want to pump and dump and flip and sell what they've got um, without doing the longer, harder work. And so, again, that sort of 95%, I guess, will slowly whittle away. And that, it, that's, it's almost like a herd. You can go back to sort of like um, population health or um, sort of like farming. Um, but in terms of like herd mentality and what have you, there's a, a group over here that are all battling for the same thing, for the same resources and not realizing that we're only a year or two into the industry. Why not open that up and sort of grow out, yeah. differentiate, become your own thing. Very few people have actually gone, well, look, what have I got unique to offer to the cannabis industry and turn that into a service, turn that into a business and create something new that's unique to you that no one can compete with you on. That's yeah. what we've done. No one can really compete with us on what we do. There's very few people with degrees and backgrounds in the science, but also very few people who've then gone and got the UK exposure and have the networks and what have you as well. Mm, yeah. But what I do now is spend most of my time after seeing that exact problem is helping people leverage what they've already got. So most people come into it going, oh, cannabis. I've got to join the herd, join the bandwagon, get a white label brand. And oh my God, what else do I do? That's it. <laughs> people mm. not realizing that oh i've got a construction company oh i could be selling hemp concrete and plugging that into my existing network with my existing clout i don't have to start from scratch and it's just a learning process that i guess everyone's been through but that what was it 2018 when we had the law change um yeah. it's only been a year and a half two years and, uh, and it so infantile no one knows what they're doing but if you know what you're doing and you've got the right people the right communities and the right ethos you can create something for the long term that's going to be that's going to dominate because you've got no competition there's no one out there doing half of this stuff and it's all so unique and in um, in its infancy that anything can be popping up now and if you've got a dream or a vision you should go and create that rather than jumping onto the sort of cbd brand and that's basically all i end up um, working on a lot of the time with people is just going, look, you, why would you start from scratch? You've already got all this wonderful knowledge over here that you can bring in, leverage, package up, service it, offer yeah. it, create but, something for that long term because no one's looking past three years. So after 2021, I don't know what anyone's going to do. I think yeah. that's as far as anyone's thought reading. But yeah, but it's, it's, it's interesting. That be, it almost becomes like a photocopy of a photocopy. So a few succeed and then others go, I want to do that. So I, yeah. want a, I want a similar font, similar packaging. So this is how we ended up with CBD advertised and non-psychoactive. You know, how we ended up with um, sort of even the language around it. There's some some of the studies were refusing to say that high dose CBD will make you drowsy. Um, so they said it was a, a sleep inducing agent um, as a way to get around it because again, it's getting around regulation. So I think the main thing is, is adaption. The companies and the industry is adapting to the regulation rather than adapting for the fucking potential. So it's exactly what you're saying. They're yeah, looking yeah. at sure. where's the where's the law gonna be in three years, not where's the knowledge in the rest of the fucking world and everything else. And I think if we looked at something like that, 
as, as we said in podcast one with Trev and that man, we could literally be looking at a Star Trek future because yeah, long, exactly. far, be, far beyond us discussing this as a drug, you have the industrial applications of this with graphene and, and quantum um, quantum computing and, and energy production and storage. You yeah. know what I mean? So again, farming, when hemp's gone off that way, they're still fighting just to extract the flowers for CBD to, to inflate that market. Rather than going, well, what can we do about carbon sequestration? Actually, how does it affect our soils? Then what does it do with this, this, this? They're not, there's again a huge education, there's these huge gaps across the entirety of the industry, which I think is deliberately being shoehorned and crowbarred apart by the profiteers, by the, oh, um, it's the, it's head, the hedge funds. Business plan. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, not just them. Um, and it, it applies to CBD companies, it applies to cultivators, it applies to. I guess consultants in a way, there's a lot of people selling the same stuff, not realizing they've got so much more they can offer. Um, but on that note, gentlemen, I don't know how inappropriate this is, but bathroom breaks, what's the protocol? Oh, crack on, man. Yeah, we, we, we'll just, we'll just, that. we'll just jib jab away there. You're grand. Take Top your time. Man. Take Two your time. <laughs> All these coffees, it's late in the day. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say, it's not just, it's not just them though. I mean, it's pol- it, It's a political thing as well. Do you know what I mean? I mean, especially when I see articles saying that in ten or ten or fifteen years there'll be farming will be non-existent in the UK, that it, everything will be relying on import Im- imports and stuff like that. <laughs> Not with the ports closed. Yeah, yeah. No, I appreciate that. Like and, and stuff. But I mean, if that's your fucking attitude, that you're just yeah, going to yeah. rely on sort of fucking yeah. capitalism, like do you know that kind of way, then. It's be, it's because, it's been created by that, and what you have is 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 an awful lot of opportunism, and and generally the copy and paste thing is is probably not taught as a successful business model. Is, do you know that kind of way? It's it's because you need to analyze your market. It's market driven auto compliance to a level where um, they figure out what is acceptable to be used um, in conjunction with any sort of pre existing zeitgeist, and they fucking market the market the product so that it fits that and it and and it becomes sellable that's what we're dealing with here that's the truth of it well yeah and the, and the marketing drives the profit and the profit ultimately then drives the direction of the business yeah um, but, but i mean if, if that's the case right you're gonna have people sat in the fucking boardroom going right company x did this company y did this and and you know the, the, hence the copy and pasting kind of a thing mm-hmm. oh we'll slap this on the label because that fucking worked do you know that kind of way? And it, it becomes that sort of, well, why is that your drive? Well, it's your drive to make fucking money, to get yourself out of this fucking obligation that is fucking modern day slavery, that is your nine to five job. Do you know what I mean? Because you make more money and you don't have to do it as for as long a period. You don't have to do it till you're 60. Yeah. That's fucking embedded right yeah. here. Like, do yeah. you know what I mean? So it's a very difficult thing to, to combat. Sorry, that's, that, that's that's probably a really, really odd way of coming no, that, back no, into no, a conversation. On, <laughs> no, no, it, I, it, it's a... It's unlearning a lot of bad habits, I guess, and going back to that basis of, well, look, I need to develop me and my mind so yeah. that I can improve in this place. And I think, and what I see again is, and half of the difficulty of consulting is finding people who can be taught and can be consulted for a start, because you get lots of people as well that come to you that want to tell you how to consult them. Like, well, hang on, you've come to me, yeah. the expert, for advice. Uh don't it, how do you want me to work in here like if you're if you're going to tell me what to do like it's just defeats the purpose of having well, it it's it's the it, Dun- Dun- kruger effect isn't it well yeah, i'm very glad you said that simple and with regards to dunning kruger and if you don't know um to give an outline it's basically competence versus uh confidence i believe I think those are the two names of it, but anyway, but basically the less competent you are, the more confident you are in those early stages. And like something like cannabis, where it is only two years in, we've got a lot of very confident people who have very weak knowledge and competency. And we've got this massive spike in people that are extremely confident. And what we're seeing now is this sort of plateau into the valley of despair where people are slowly going, oh my God, did that actually happen? I, do I know what I'm doing? Have I done this mm-hmm. before? I've just lost all this money. I haven't sold any of this. 
Um, and my company's not getting any funds. What's going on? What am I doing wrong? And basically, Dunning Kruger then says, well, that you've got to start reamassing that knowledge so that you are competent and you do know what you're doing and you can be confident because you are competent <laughs> and we're a year into the industry no one can know what they're doing and even the scientists like we don't know what the industry's uh what future holds because yeah. it's not really based on anything at the moment other than political whim mm. but ultimately the science is all pointing in one direction and you can encapsulate and leverage a lot from that science. And again, if you've got a wonderful network, wonderful assets, all you need is some new knowledge to completely rethink your business and whatever it get again, be whether it's say a cannabis club or some policing problems as well. Like science is there. We have scientists for a reason to solve societal problems and develop the world. Yeah. Cannabis just seems to be one of those areas where no one wants to develop. Everyone's quite happy yeah. with where they are or again, I've had a lot of people that don't really want an informed consumer because they're like, oh, well, they'll ask me questions they don't have answers to. Well, yeah, that's the nature of it. But you've got to accept that you don't know everything and you can't mm -hmm. legislate for everything as well. And I think that's the key point is like going back to what you said about, um, I guess, sort of the legislative parameters and boundaries and reflecting future change and having that open endedness to it um i think that's really what we're lacking at the moment why nothing seems to be going anywhere and maybe some people like that as well it is being held back there's a lot of people positioning there's a lot of money moving around but um it can all be done with a lot more coherence a lot more collaboration a lot more alignment and again mm -hmm. like there's so much that can be learned from spending a couple of hours with a patient spending a couple of hours with a gp and just understanding what their problems are and that's something that 95 percent plus of companies haven't done either so um there's yeah if you don't know your consumer i think that's probably one of the well to my knowledge that's probably one of the cornerstones of marketing and sales is know your know your consumer and know your mm -hmm. product as well but um yeah dunning kruger i think is probably the best outline of cannabis industry you can possibly get at the moment and again like you were saying simple like a lot of a lot of the times the patients know more than the doctor and that's embarrassing for doctors when they don't know enough about the medicine either and mm -hmm. they're being asked to prescribe it or they're charging hundreds of pounds for a consultation for it so there's a lot of um i guess egos that need to be set aside but also a lot of people that need to um oh learn have a lot more that they can offer that they probably yeah. haven't uncovered yet, don't know is there or haven't really appreciated because they're too focused on what's everyone else doing and yeah, yeah rather yeah. than what I can do. Yeah, exactly that. I think it's um, it's like Darwinism, isn't it? It's the it's those that survive are the most adaptable. And I think the same is true of then the infancy of the alcohol industry post uh, the repeal of the 18th Amendment in America. So the vast majority of the companies didn't survive. The ones that did are the ones that very quickly moved with the times. They recognized what was happening, changed the products. Because especially in the CBD game now, if you build yourself around, as majority of them did for several years, the the fallacy of the sort of 0 0.2, and yeah. of, uh, you know, then it caused a lot of harm. And then there's a lot of places you could drive county to county. One place would be selling CBD flowers. One place would be calling it hemp tea and selling it. One place would be... And the, the enforcement of it was so patchwork, was so postcode, postcode lottery is the, the expression is. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of the, the industry is, it's FOMO, it's fear of missing out. I think that they're, they're going, I'm in this, I'm in this. And nobody, because none of them have a clue, they're waiting for the first one to take off in one direction and go, fuck me, follow that guy. And I think that's what it's, it's stagnating now. So but then it's become cannibalistic. So I think you're going to see that plateau of profit, profits as well, because there's only so many uninformed individuals they can they can sell to. Look, yeah, at, what, yeah. look at what happens in Canada, where then it's something where 35, 40% of people are still consuming from the illicit market because they trust them. It's better quality. They know exactly where it's coming from. They'd rather support that than corporate fat cats and ever increasing classes divide uh, and wealth inequality. So I think the same translates over, over to the, to the UK. And I think until there's more representation 
of the majority marketplace, the so-called recreational consumer, which again, we could argue, I suppose, the semantics that all consumption has medicinal and therapeutic effects, ego is considered medical. Um, but because again, of that legislation, it's muddied that conversation. So we're still really struggling. There are people in this country. I mean, I still get messages through the Durham page and even on my personal page uh, of people asking for um, sort of <laughs> like med asking for medical can of medical herbal cannabis but not street cannabis so do, do you know what i mean so they're asking for pharmaceutical grade. then when i talk to them about so do you mean in terms of pharmaceutical grade or do you want to imp imported stuff and they're like no not the stuff that you smoke the stuff that they get that's the, the medical Same thing. yeah yeah trying to explain then the, it's because it's a very small nuance really it's not that's just, that's produced under good manufacturing practices they do this this and this to it whereas on the street it could be from this which is worst case scenario to this best case scenario yeah. and unfortunately most people still trust that because at least there's i believe there is more people in the illicit marketplace that produce for out of passion out of love and out of um a want to truly meaningfully help people than in the business side of it so they'll allow shit product to go to market they'll allow things that have failed tests to go to market still because ah it will get away with it it's not going to cause that much harm at the end of the day there's no regulation who's going to see it whereas yeah. then somebody who then grows a plant and has an issue with it and then goes i can't sell that I can't do anything with that. And then they'll be, literally bin it. You know what I mean? Because that's the right thing to do. I think until that ethos, until that philosophy translates from the illicit or criminalized market to the leg legitimate or allowed, you know, market, then we're going to see a further, further d uh, division. I think you're right there with um, the division, but not only that the sort of ethos of the black market like that's where the medical arguments come from and i think a lot of people go oh the black market or oh, the um the illicit market and the self-reliant group well that's where all this medical cannabis that's where all this cbd who heart originated it didn't just appear yeah. out of nowhere like this is being and same goes for novel foods like it's all been there for ages. We're just pretending now that it's all sort of new stuff and we're just mm -hmm. coining all this sexy language so we can uh, separate it out into different groups and separate ourselves. Oh, no, that's not what we do. We do this. Well, yeah, it's all cannabis. It's all a plant. Let's be real. Just, mm -hmm. but again, people can only say certain things depending on what their investors have told them and there's liabilities, insurance to throw around. So um, I think maybe, again, the bet like and what, my opinion is anyway, the best tools we can sort of arm everyone with is that consumer education and just an openness of what the industry is like, because a cannabis company will tell you anything. And then what you read in the news and in the media is that doesn't really tell you anything anyway. <clears throat> but um, yeah, again, it comes down to in consumers and users of the products being as impartially informed and as well equipped as they possibly can be. And again, that's why we've gone down the route of creating educational materials hmm. alongside the consulting is because <clears throat> we've got a duty to the patients and consumers as well. And again, people in the industry that don't even know what they don't know. So people making, making um, bad calls when they don't even know it's a bad call. They just think, oh, well, I'm saving some money or, or I'll just keep reusing that thing or we'll just pass that extra product over there. Like people don't realize what, potentially they're doing how they're potentially jeopardizing people's jobs and going back to that 0 0.2 uh, comment you made simple like we're lucky that no one lost their jobs from taking a crappy product like if you're taking cbd you're usually taking it because you think it's going to be legal but you don't expect any of that to show up on your drugs test and in america and australia it's happened where <clears throat> someone's been taking cbd products but it's accidentally got thc in it and so failed lost the jobs and it's only a matter of time until bad things like that or negative things like that keep are happening in the uk and sort of hold back the industry further so again like um i think the industry's got a lot of maturing to do it is obviously all still very much in its infancy but the science is here it's all there to be tapped mm -hmm. into it just mm -hmm. <clears throat> realizing that you can learn more there's more that yeah you might not know there's things that you can benefit from if you do know certain mm -hmm. things and like knowledge is power really but um it, wasted wasted potential and uh 
opportunity is another like that's the opposite end of the spectrum like that that's there's mm-hmm. nothing worse so again i think these conversations more people that tune into podcasts like this you're going to get some juicy nuggets and yeah. it's not stuff that's going to be heard in the mainstream and it is all alternative views and perspectives that aren't filtered or um massaged in different directions it is all very much honest truthful conversations and just sharing of information impartially without the goal of Again, oh, check out my brand. Check out my buy my go buy my oil. Yeah. Um, it like yeah. we we do we do the education now. We truly liberate the people <clears throat> from the shackles of prohibition, and we we free their minds from decades of propaganda. Um, there's something that popped in my head that you might actually, because of your um, conversations with police, know. On a standard, you know, the four-way drug test uh, the police use at the side of the road. Does that test for cannabinoids or does it, does it test specifically for THC? Um, it te- so it's not THC, it's the um, metabolite of, um, and the, I don't actually think the roadside test is standardized across the UK. I think um, different constabularies can choose different testing kits mm-hmm. to my knowledge. And again, it's like you budget for your own kit. So it might be that, and I, I genuinely don't know at this point, but yeah. I know that police have that flexibility in budget and they can choose to buy certain things, choose not to. They've got like a shopping list sort of thing. Yeah. But the, that's a very good point though, Simpra, is that like that's something that they're facing in Australia, looking at in various parts of North America as well. Like how, how are we going to enforce this on the roads? Do we just treat it like we do um, opioids where, well, if you feel drowsy, don't drive. It's not, well, oh my God, if it's in your system, scumbag, zero tolerance, yeah. that's, Take away his license, yeah. uh, <laughs> filthy animal, could have killed people. Well, people <clears throat> drive around on codeine, people drive around on oxycontin, in all sorts of crazy prescription drugs. It's just, again, having an open conversation about all of it. And I think yeah. probably the key point is words can mean very different things to different people. And mm-hmm. the accuracy of language and why, again, we sort of hammer on the science is because there's a certain accuracy of language that's required in order to sort of progress conversations forward. And if you're being sloppy with conversations, you end up missing a lot of info, overlooking a lot of things, but also potentially making a lot of errors and mistakes along the way. So it holds everything back if that um, openness isn't there. And again, probably why I moved away from solo consulting is if you're working inside a company, you can't be impartial. You're, your interest is in saying the right thing so again if you've got that that um impartial sounding board you'll just get told what you need to hear not what you want to hear and i think again that's the difference for patients businesses Mm. and regulators as well like you might not want to hear some of this Mm -hmm. but there's a lot that can be approved there's a lot more that you need to know and there's a lot of things that you're not factoring in and um again when it comes to legislation particularly, you can't legislate for everything. So you've got to have a degree of flexibility for those yeah. unknowns right. and for that growth towards the future, like say some print. Yeah. We're just looking at CBD, but we're wasting our time. What are we doing? So much more there, but again, yeah. we, it, this doesn't make sense. It's a, uh, I'm vaguely, there's an article flying around in my head of the back. I see it flickering from like some I've read in maybe 2016, 17, 2017, I think. Do, what um do we not metabolize cbd into thc good point and good question um so this is another debatable one because we i would say we don't truly know but there is um an, an environment can be created where if you put cbd into an acidic condition into an acidic environment sorry it can convert into thc um and so there was a group that um, basically demonstrated this in uh, simulated gastric acid, gastric juices, they put CBD in, THC came out. But then just recently, there was another company that said, oh, well, well, we gave everyone CBD and no THC was found in the urine, so therefore nothing happened. But you don't know what's happening between the consumption and uh, the Mm. urine. It may be, well... It could do anything in the blood and then yeah. 
Uh, sorry, it's just like, it's, 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 it's an scientific. measurement. Though, if we're doing the blood, fair enough. But it's like once it's active in the body, then what what happens? But oh, too popular. But um, it a very contentious conversation as well. And so, if you're consuming CBD, are you then potentially breaking the law because your stomach's mm. converting it into THC? And again, that's another point in the book as well. Like we just don't know any of this. There's mm-hmm. There's a lot so, of discussion that needs to be had and a lot of grey area that needs to be explored as well and transparently not just... So is, is, is meta- Yeah, is metabolised THC it's closest to an andamide, isn't it? In terms of endogenous cannabinoids. Because my thought then is if we're c- criminalising an external molecule or an external... something put in externally, exogenously, that then converts into something criminal... Couldn't they then not just then do every human for the process by which they produce the the same molecule, or is there Naturally, enough of a yeah. difference between the the exogenous consumed THC metabolite and the endogenous version? If you know what I mean. Endogenous. It, I mean, the argument's there because it's a supplement in a way, because um, it is nourishing that system, but it's I guess in a way also non-essential. So. There's lots of ways of looking at it, but I think that's what it comes down to as well, is that all we're doing here is mimicking stuff that's already in the body. Um, And obviously there's other drugs that do that. There's other plants that do that for other molecules and compounds, but we're just talking about cannabis at the moment. And we're so fixated on legislation that the science seems to become useless. Like we're focusing on again, CBD is one molecule. How? Why are we trying to black and white molecules and black and white science? There isn't. It's not binary. It's not yeah. um, a series of yeses and nos or zeros and ones. It's it's everything in between. It is quantum in a way. Or it, the yeah, world's quantum. And again, going back to thinking outside the box and not being linear. Legislators, regulators. You can't legislate for something you're not educated on. And it'd be like me trying to go and make legislate. I mean, I could be the best regulator in the world, but if I've got to go and regulate something, say going from uh, tree cutting to cannabis medical sciences, like you're just not like obviously the principles will translate, but you need some expertise. And you all like asking for help isn't a bad thing, but like we're just getting to these points where the industry, the regulators, the government's hitting all these dead ends whether they're manufactured dead ends or what, they're still hitting these same endpoints, and it comes down to that lack of knowledge and awareness and information. And it's usually because it's la, 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 oh, there's yeah. no, evidence, no evidence, not because it's not there. It just hasn't been put on a plate in front of them and delivered in a, again, a non-textual way, but a multimedia yeah. barrage of knowledge that, well, this is why you should know about it. It's not just... Uh, scumbag, you need to change the laws. Well, mm-hmm. this is why it's important. This is why people are frustrated. This is why the police are facing challenges. This is why the GPs can't get anywhere. And just having all of those broad conversations mm. in one debate um, and moving it away from scattered, segmented conversations and uh, so, as well behind closed doors. So, yeah, that's so, where we want to go as well. And yeah. What, can, what so, can we do? do to create cohesion then and conversations within the wider community because obviously there seems to be a, a certain gentrifying of the legal industry so these people that are then still providing on mass illegally because of their background and because of their perceived criminality they are deemed less than yet, yet on the other sort of side like we said there are then people that have come into this and yes, made a successful brand and being good at their, their corner of the market and whatnot, but then they're then the people that are put on panels to speak as experts. They're the people that are given government advisory positions to help these regulators decide. And then on the other side of it, we've got successive prime ministers. Oh God, my camera's going crazy. Successive prime ministers um, that then block the appointment 
of, of individuals with actual information, education and knowledge on the subjects from getting into these positions. So I could kind of empathize a lot with them. If they've, if they've got literally 4% vision of the world right now, they're going to keep making that same decision. Yeah, yeah. So until we can get that information, I think so it permeates out from everything. So it's if we can affect the movies they watch, if we can affect them in the same way, you've got people like, what was it, Ed Sheeran and Stormzy, he had a song about basically lighting a joint and passing it around. And they had it unedited on the radio and it was in number one and it was everywhere all over the radio. So it's little things like that. We erode it through the culture and it permeates until all of these naysayers, all of these um, unin uninformed prohibitionists, then they don't realize the prohibitionists. They just take this view of all drugs are bad and they're bad because they're illegal. No yeah, conversation, yeah. deal with it. So I think if the more they can see it, so in Coronation Street and shit, when they have... Uh, stories about somebody taking illegal oil or whatever. All of these things really do sort of help, I think, and in some ways actually get us there faster. Because if you look at it, uh, a lot of the um, the the uh, countries around the world that are then changing their position, they're changing it either because of first-hand stories from, from medical users or, or lived experience people, or because of the cultural shift so, so literally the younger cu cu uh, cultures already adopt this from the rest of the world, uh, other parts of the world that have legalized and accepted cannabis as normalization. So then it kind of pushes out the old world view of it. And as the, uh, the more time that passes, that becomes the norm and they go, it just, it changes. So I think, unfortunately, that's going to change faster than the legislation. Do you know what I mean? The culture and everything else, the infrastructure, we'll just build it the same way Canada did with dispensaries before. And then the, the legislators will just sit down and go, what the fuck? No, they sell weed everywhere. How? What's happening? Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think it's a, it's a sad thing, but it's also a good thing because it allows those that are brave and bold and have the the knowledge and experience to go out and risk it. Because while the fat cats will sit pretty, making sure that this they live on the letter of the legislation, there'll be people pushing those boundaries, and because of those individuals, those heroes, that legislation will keep moving and moving until one day we're free, and I don't have to sit here and talk about it anymore. Uh, well. I think on that now, I'll add that we have a mentorship program scheme where I want to try and help other young people get into the cannabis industry and do exactly that. And that's what we're about is basically building that future because, again, no, most people don't know what they're doing. So if there are people that do want to build that future, if you do want to get involved in a group of and a community of people that are trying to build something and work towards something, um, I'd love to hear from you. GCS would love to hear from you. And um, I don't know, I guess I would fire simple questions as well, ways to get in touch because we're pretty well, um, I don't know, we've got a good dialogue channel. But um, you, you, you're dead right, Simper. And I just wish more people were in it for the long term and saw the long term potential because legalization, decriminalization, that's all coming. There's only so long you can deny the science. But once it gets there, what are people going to do? And you've got a couple of years now to start thinking about whole, what do you want to be doing in the future and what do you want your business to look like? Mm -hmm. You can start laying those foundations now. You can start building those opportunities, making those partnerships, getting in the networks, finding the right team members, working with the right people. Yeah. It's just, um, again, getting out and starting and not, going down the route of following that herd or going super hardline and getting tied in with some mafia group or um, some gang. Like you, there's so much there that people can bring to the industry and to offer the marketplace as well. It, it, now is the perfect opportunity to get involved with it. And um, yeah. yeah, young people, old people, it's never too late to start business, but like, the most important thing is you start and just get st start doing it. Um, so we've got, yeah, a, a nice group of uh, young people who we sort of um, have a couple of meetings a month with just to touch base with, make sure they're going in the right direction, help out anyone if they need some coaching or some problem solving or they need a contact or mm -hmm. how do I do a sales pitch or whatever. Like We've That's all been through it before. So it's just passing it on and making sure that more people can get access to it, but like just aren't making the same mistakes that, we see all the time and um, carrying that forward as well. Like we're bringing that cannabis community ethos to the cannabis industry as well. And just building a community as well in the industry, around the industry, but the, the dialogues between patients, communities and industry as well. And with the, with the government as well, like everyone just seems so disconnected at the moment. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, and going forward, 
Um, we'll be hosting a series of sort of uh, recorded debates, live debates, live Q and A's, where we'll just have scientists at the center of those conversations and just start bringing people to the table and saying, well, look, look, here are the problems, here's the science, let's start building these conversations and sharing this information. And um, this is what we've been trying to do for a while now, but it's only just sort of now that we've got, um, I guess, the, the support, but the industry willpower for it as well. So uh, this next couple of weeks, there'll be plenty to sort of keep an ear to the ground for i'll mm. share it all with you guys and make sure that you're fully aware of it all yeah. as well but, i've just pulled um, up your uh, website there and uh, <clears throat> shown them the sort of contact page and whatever if anybody wants to get in contact with you i've also got the uh, the website um text up here as well um where do you foresee having those sort of panel-esque interviews would it be sort of a zoom thing or a youtube thing or anything like that yeah i, I think we're going to go against that mixed multimedia multi-pronged attack where we'll be the presentations we'll be recording making them into a little video that can be shown but then have sort of live debates and conversations like this and make sure as well that um you guys can speak to all the other interesting people that are out there and some of the leading scientists as well i'm just a sort of um yeah in my own infancy i guess as a scientist but um again there's people out there that i can rely on and that uh, um have decades more experience than me but from say north america or they've worked in canada yeah. and um all over the world and so there's some really interesting conversations that we're looking forward to bring into the uk and again just some alternative perspectives as well that you don't really get a lot of you get a lot of the same people saying the same stuff on cannabis conversations and uh different platforms so that no, sounds yeah, great more about the diversity and uh spreading of the science and just uh, yeah getting the alternative uh, perspectives yeah, i'm there. looking forward to that yeah. sure that, that, yeah that sounds really good and i think yeah it would be important to get uh the consumer the community the opportunity to speak to people who are informed like that because it would help them um as a community and as advocate and activists be as informed as possible because unfortunately the dunning kruger effect permeates throughout all parts <laughs> of the community all parts of indeed humanity it would seem um we're always forever learning you have to stay on this as much as humanly possible because it's ever fluctuating there's so much information there's so much yeah. that you need to continually ingest to uh to stay up to, to stay up to date um so there's there's a fucking camera. Sorry. Sorry. Guys. Just to point out um, as well, just before you you um, um, sway it one way or another and you move away from okay. that point, um, <clears throat> there was one thing that I personally struggled with. Um, well, I I previously per personally struggled with, which was feeling sort of semi subliminally inferior, um, and from a knowledge perspective, so much so that I won't wouldn't ask my question. In a, in a live event because I would feel like I'm making an idiot of myself and that's because I'm, that's because I'm you know I have a certain degree of insecurity that's fine I've dealt with that I, I, I'm, I'm a lot better with it now but I'd imagine there's an awful lot of people that would feel that way so maybe a good thing to do would be to have uh, an ability uh, for um, people that feel that way to have a, uh, a pre-prepared question as in they could send their question ahead of time yeah um kind of a thing so that might that might alleviate and encourage people in my position say to actually go okay i'll just ask it i don't have to feel like yeah. nervous and shit on the spot or whatever that that's that's a brilliant idea you could also put in uh potentially a surrogate so if you were going to undo it on zoom say i mean i'd, I'd volunteer myself to that service quite happily yeah. um where then someone could sit here with their whatever page get people to post to their page and draw the questions through um yeah then you, that'd be super again, as well guys because again you get it from the consumer it's just again to get because it's say the question i've just asked you about the metabolizing and, and whatever else that's a conversation that again without this sort of platform isn't really going to happen elsewhere because the people who know don't think to talk about it the people who don't know don't think to ask it or again maybe feel that inferiority i mean just to, to alleviate you Micah, i still feel that everywhere whenever no, i'm on stage I'm and i'm speaking to you it yeah, still I makes me go that. i'm not yeah. sure what i'm doing yeah no no, no. I, I i that's the reason i say it because i know that every fucking person and they're lying to you if they say that they don't they feel like that so it is it is something and i just on a lighter note because we're on it the worst one for me was asking graham hancock a question fuck oh, wow. me 
fuck me to a point where he misunderstood the question and I was like grand Jack grand I'm gonna sit down <laughs> I asked him a question I'm done I'm out um, but yeah if we get him on here I'm gonna fucking ask him again um. <laughs> very good point though Mac and again that's what um, we want to facilitate as much as possible is making sure it's just accessible as well there won't mm. be any thousand pound attendance charges it'll be that we the sponsors paid us helped us cover all of this we want to make sure that you get as much out of it as possible and we like all we want to do is start a dialogue make sure that like everyone knows that the science is here come and access it come and tap into it awesome mm-hmm. and we all want to help we all want to share this information like all this information is useless unless we share it and apply it so yeah. um yeah. it's sort of our jobs as scientists to yeah educate people and make sure it's used and applied but Again, otherwise, what's the point? Um, so that is exactly what we want to, again, facilitate. And questions, answers, we'll make sure that, and we'll have to work with you guys on it as well, making sure it's as easily accessible and in, as engaging and um, all-encompassing as possible. Because that's awesome. what we want to just reignite, is that excitement and passion, again, from the grassroots communities and mm. um, from the industry as well. I mean, the industry, I guess, just does its own thing. Um, at the moment yeah. but it, there's so much there to be excited about it, just want to give it a focal point and a, a starting point to spring yeah. from so um you i've only got a few more questions that i'll keep you for fire away um, no, I'm in no rush now. You, you've um sort of worked with ukcsc and teesside cannabis club um sort of in the past the cannabis club scene in the uk other than i suppose teesside at the minute is is really floundering and really struggling to to, to get a footing. Obviously, the global pandemic of COVID-19 hasn't helped in the slightest. Um, but there are a lot of, of people wondering what's going to happen. Obviously, let's not think of COVID so much in terms of regulation, in terms of interest from investors and from, from other entities. Because I would say that, frankly, the UK is only beaten by Spain at the minute in terms of the closeness it has to perfecting a model that could be distributable across the world. America and Canada have yet to figure out social consumption. They're going down lounges where you yeah. buy here, you got to cross yeah. the road and do this. There's all kinds of limitations, whereas a lot of the underground clubs, the clubs that were not affiliated to the UK CSE or, or not public and not trying to make themselves public that still operate today, the, the models that they have, they've, they've cracked this. They've got security down. They've got supply down. You know what I mean? If, if, if a bad batch comes in, it doesn't go out to the end user. You know what I mean? Just because they don't have currently the scientific capability to test oh God, to test stuff um, doesn't mean that they, they're not wanting to. They're not willing to. Oh, no, precisely. Do you know what I mean? So I, I just want to pick your brain on terms of what you think the near future to long term potentially holds for cannabis social clubs or just cannabis clubs mm. regardless of the definition uh, distinction there i think they are the best form of cannabis activism um and the most creative form um what i want to see is one of those in every town and every community every council has got a cannabis infrastructure in some way where it's decentralized and people have a community where they can access things and it becomes a sharing rebuilds a community really and i think again maybe that's why north america struggled so much and probably in the uk as well we've got a lot of fractured damaged communities at the moment whether it be police versus patients or um some racial tensions or whatever it be consumer versus police in general yeah well <laughs> people versus politicians whatever however you are masks versus no masks and like whatever you want to separate it out as we're very good at polarizing and very good at um dividing on subjects but not so great around unifying around them and cannabis clubs particularly an incredible thing to unify around and build a community around and all you've got to do is just get a bunch of people in one room and have a conversation police community members leaders whatever it be and start a dialogue, see what people want. And Teesside's a wonderful example of how that can flourish. And they've like they've risked it, they've risked it all to get to where they are, but that's paved the way and shown that it can be done. And I think that's probably the most important important thing that Mike was probably wanted to prove was that it just can be done. Um and there's a wonderful opportunity there for so many people to work together and get on. And again, that's what I was saying about um, the sort of uh, unexplored opportunities that haven't really been tapped into. 
is something that is the perfect solution, but no one wants to consider it because we're too scared to just let things happen. We want to legislate and put very safe boundaries around everything, mm -hmm. categorize it and segregate everything off. And all, again, all that does is sort of break down the community, break down the collaboration because everyone's segregated and sectioned off. And um, again, medical, recreational, it all revolves around the same plan, but until we're having a conversation about all those dimensions, we're just missing out on everything yeah. and again to not even bring the endocannabinoid system into the conversation 50 percent of the debate's already gone yeah we exactly exactly that if we're, we're in a, an, a very unfortunate position at the minute in the because of the mindset of people going we have to take the legislative steps which to, to lesser and certain degrees i'm not going to argue about the nuance of it right now i kind of half agree with because it has to go that way to take the people that don't know what I know, that haven't lived my life, that don't know what the fuck I know, that can't know what I know, rather. Um, so I don't hold that against them. But at the same time, the damage that's caused every time they shift that bar a slight bit, they go, oh, look at this tiny victory for business. And they make all this fucking money. And that then funds back through lobbyists to keep politicians deliberately in the dark or paid the fuck off. The same thing happens through education. If you then show yourself in a pharmaceutical company or in a research and development at some private corporation and you develop a new novel thing, rather than you going to the market going, well, look at what the fuck we've just found. They go, here's some extra cash, shut the fuck up, get back in there and see what the hell we can do with it. Do you know what I mean? So we, we're seeing this limited, very much a, so that gives the this facade for, to a lot of people that there is this stagnation where there isn't. There's this stagnation in the corporate end point of it in terms of the, 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 sales, the sales point because they're limited through the bottleneck of the legislation, whereas the creative nature of it is fucking flourishing behind closed doors in private industry and in the illicit market. And I don't know what we can do to unbottleneck that that re regulation. And I think until we do so, the the uh, the the impediment of the thought of being criminalised is going to stop millions of people in this country from innovating or from trying to grow their own, trying to learn this, or even bothering to going. I'm too scared to grow a plant. I'm too scared to have more than an ounce in the house or whatever sort of barrier they've put in their own mind. Um, so they're like, why would I then inform myself? Whereas it's exactly what you said before about preparing for it. It's analogous to say um, you're pulling up to a hundred yards race and you literally go, oh, when the gun fires, I'll get out of the car and put my shoes on and shit and I'll go. Nah, everybody yeah, else yeah. is lined up. They're gone. If you think you're going to start something when this goes, when that, they un let that bottleneck go, no, the pressure that is in this system is, is enormous. And I, I, for one, cannot wait to see what an unrestricted cannabis market looks like because there's some people in prison right now that have far better ideas than the people that are in boardrooms. And that's the thing, how much is being untapped, overlooked, and that's what frustrates me as well, is how much is being sort of stifled and inhibited by our very minuscule view. Like we're, our whole cannabis conversation has gone down to CBD, is it a novel food? Yes, no, like that. We've, we've tried to make it binary, from a, from a massive, massive conversation, we found that one binary sweet spot for the legislators where they can go, oh yes, it's definitely that, and we can treat it like this and throw some regulatory noose around it. And it's never gonna end well if you've got regulators, God love them, but if you've got regulators making the, the decisions, because well, what's it based on? Well, made up regulation <laughs> personal, <laughs> personal, personal it? prejudice it's about yeah, what yeah, the individual in that role what that guy thinks about drugs so when he goes home and he watches telly it's about what the media drives so every time whatever paper he reads depends on what his fucking viewpoint is the conversations he has down the pub that all drives it so then when he comes along and he's going you've got to then look at this and then compile all the data that they're allowed to be given access to that already yeah. basically informs their decision prior to it they then put it through the spectrum of their prejudice and <laughs> whatever bullshit we live under today until the next change and the next change and the next change. And because nobody at the national level or international level that I can see is being allowed to be brave enough to say, you're all fucking wrong. We need to go for the end point instead of this. You will make far more money. We will save far more lives. We will protect the planet in-, in And you'll be a hero. Yeah, you yeah. and you will go down. You'll exactly, if we can convince hero. one guy, be like, do you want to be the dude, the dude that sorts this shit? Because there's enough people can go through the channels to get a platform at the UN.
at an international level to, to see change. We have just seen it, granted a very mild change by all, all means that then isn't affected by the other legislation. So it's kind of null. It was just a, here's a gesture. Do you know what I mean? But that means enough people convened in that fucking room to make that decision. Why aren't they the people that are informed, that are passionate, that actually know this? Because they're so, they're so disillusioned and disconnected from this. They don't probably don't have somebody that personally has benefited from cannabis in terms of helping their illness or saving their life. They've never known anything other than the, the hoodies, the druggies. Do you know what I mean? The shit that they see. So why would they make this arbitrary change? They go, yeah, the pharmaceutical company can handle this at that end. Forgetting that there's millions, tens of millions of people around the world that rely on an illicit marketplace every day to provide them with pain relief, to provide them with an opportunity to sleep, to, to stimulate their appetite. Do you know what I mean? To stop fits. It's, it, it's preposterous and bullshit that, we, again, we're, as you say, we're stuck on this binary thing of two cannabinoids that, again, we're on the verge of really cracking open the rest of this toolkit and understanding what the fuck it can do. Completely. And I think this is probably a good time to... Uh plug the free guide that we've got on the website map if you've still got the website up. Oh yeah. The cannabis crash course. Oh, that yes. is basically everything simple we were saying there in a nutshell. The process of knowledge oh, and yeah. how it's then expelled and expressed and put out there into the public. Words, Ooh, it's legislation. It's a freebie. Download it, share it, go wild. I um, think we'll be in the bio below folks. Yeah. Um but basically what there's a science in itself of watching how badly the media reports on medical research so um there's some interesting stats in there about basically how what you're reading in the mainstream media is probably 20 percent of the truth from what was actually in the initial article or initial findings of the study they're reporting on um and secondly it will help you differentiate between well factual claims versus fictional claims mm -hmm. what is the basis of knowledge going back down to what i was saying earlier about words what do certain words mean what do people like thinking about what do people mean by those words do they mean the same thing by those words as you do and going to applying that to patients applying that to industry um leaders and companies as well like what sort of information are you making your decisions based on? And that goes right the way up to the, up the regulatory ladder yeah. as well. Like <laughs> what information they're making the decisions on. And a lot of the time it can be traced back to so-and-so said this or a, a, yeah. a very watered down, whittled down interpretation of the actual fact. And so our, for me, our sort of legislations are maybe representative of about 20, 30% of the evidence. And it's just very selective of what you listen to. Um, so that guides basically how to sift through crap and get to real solid information and just um, blank out all the sort of blurry and nonsense and cut through to the, the facts, the figures, um, and also then being able to question those, keep them accountable, what to look out for, just how to stay safe and make sure that what you're being told is truth and when to know, when to sort of call bullshit with that as well. So um, again, I hope that's useful to people and again, share that far and wide and um, hopefully that can be as useful to everyone as possible as well. But all dead on, all dead on. And again, why I've produced most of those materials is because of all the problems we've tapped on today. Um, linear thinking, people moving on bad information, people just not knowing their industry or the science behind their industry, not knowing the basics, the history of it, where it comes from, the grassroots communities, what what the infrastructure is like. Mm -hmm. And yeah, helping people just think beyond point A and point B. And like you say, look towards the future simple because that's where all the that's where all the gold is. That's why everyone's fighting and scrapping over little bits of branding and who's got the best SEO package, who's got the best marketer. Yeah, with the whole base it's it's the image in my head there, I don't know why I, I, I love my brain at times. Perhaps it is this lovely Girl Scout cookies I'm smoking, but it was Disneyland. <laughs> was the endless rows of ticket things at Disneyland, and there's one gate open, and all these fucking and trying to go through it. And it's like literally by change of legislation, or even in my opinion, the full fucking removal of it, 
from any drug, any of this conversation, scrap it the fuck out. It means we open all the gates and we can all wander through together and actually have a nice conversation and be gentlemanly and, and, and jovial and actually to develop things together rather than try and hide things and go, oh, we just discovered this and this variant. And yeah, there's 20 of your competitors mm-hmm. that are doing the same goddamn thing. Have you seen the sheer number of people that are marketing CBG as this new brand new? It's like... It's it's beyond. Oh, it's the next CBD. Yeah, yeah and it's the, the the evolution of this, and it's just again that's oh you've opened one more ticket machine. Well done, guys. Oh, you're gonna move the margin on the fucking THC barrier and hemp. Okay, one more. T- it's like come the fuck on. Like say if we need we need full open access for this because otherwise the people that are gonna get through those gates first, the ones that can oh excuse me cut the queue because I've got you know a fucking posse of people because of all my fucking bankroll means I can get straight in and wander straight through. Whereas the guy that actually has an idea that he's sitting on that could change the fucking world, he's got no money, he's got no capital, he doesn't have any any investor friends, he doesn't have anybody down the pub he can get a con- multi million pound contract off, you know. And I think that until we have that open access for everybody, it's the same argument I use for medical. Until we accept it's all fucking medical, go, okay, we need best business and production practices and go. Rather than saying that only this, only this little bit over here and only when we've done it, is it medical? When you do it, it's skunk and it's dangerous and it'll give you psychosis and you'll stab your granny and jump out of windows. It's, 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 again, it's it's fucking bullshit. Ludicrous, yeah. Um, I want to go... Two two more questions. Sorry for that little bit of a run there. Wait, no, no, far away. Um, uh, the the classic one again. I, I, every time I've introduced this on the podcast, I, I've I've caveated it by saying that I, I hate it. But decriminalization versus legalization in the, the infrastructure of it as it sort of stands and where it's going. Do you think we're going to have a traditional either de jure or de facto decriminalization model where like either the legislation changes to decriminalize it or the authorities just stop enforcing it? So de jure versus de facto, um, or legalize under one of the existing models that's out there? Or could we possibly be the first nation to actually hybridize and create something that doesn't criminalize anybody for anything to do with cannabis? Keep dreaming. What I would like versus what I think will happen versus what could happen all very different things. Um, What I would love to happen and what I think would be the best case scenario for everyone would would be that hybridized model where we just go, look, let's relax, take a step back. We're not going to kill anyone with this. Here's the safety measures that we need to factor in the bare minimum. And how do we, again, primary issue, you could do all of this overnight. You could decriminalize drugs overnight. But rather than legislating for everything, educate people like god forbid we start educating people and letting them protect themselves rather than how can we molly coddle people and put these little cotton wool bits of legislation around everyone and legislate for every unknown known and try and make it as black and white as possible the science isn't black and white um once you get to a certain area it's all theory and possibility and again building a direction that's why we have debates that's why we have peer reviewers so that we can discuss the big picture and discuss the future and how we get to that future and the methods for getting there the strategy for that so for me i would love to see a more tolerant approach where we're treating it as a health issue decriminalization is something that i think could happen at all it could happen overnight but equally I'm seeing conversations regarding legalization and don't get me wrong. There's a big legalization lobby. We just don't hear about it all the time yet. Um, But that's swooped in under the CBD barrier or under the CBD um, umbrella, I guess. But ultimately there's people there lobbying for legalization. It's just what that legalization will look like. Will people still be criminals if they don't use it from certain circumstances? Mm -hmm. Is everyone going to need a card so that they can be legitimate versus, well, my grandma just wants to go out in a garden. Is she yeah. a scumbag criminal now? Is she going to prison because she's grown Stabber. it like she does everything else? Or is she going to be having to go through all these loopholes? And mm-hmm. I, Most people just want an easy life. And again, what do we want to give people? Do we want to micromanage, control, and induce fear into everyone and make people treat cannabis like it's, I don't know, some sort of satanic spinach. Spice. But... Spice. I, I, yeah, exactly. I am so stealing that. Satanic spinach. <laughs> Sounds like a band, doesn't it? That, yeah, that is fucking... That is, that is G. I like that. 
Well, yeah, it, yeah. It, it's got to that point though where people are just terrified of a plant, and I'm just thinking, my God, like, well, how has it come to this? But it, it's like COVID now as well. People are terrified of COVID when again, it's like zero point zero five mortality at this point, mm -hmm. stupid percentages. It's, but it's... education, information, open debate it's the only way you're going to start cutting through the fluff getting to the core of the issue and again a lot of people don't want the core of the issue to be unveiled or dug through to and people some people don't want progress lots of people are scared to change so there's all sorts of parties to factor in but ultimately like again as a scientist what i want to make sure is that we've got the latest knowledge being applied and shared and um for us a consultancy firm has been the nicest way to make sure that we're able to cater to everyone um but in the same time we want to make sure as well that we're focusing primarily on the patients and the people that we got into this industry for and again we want to create new medicines we, and to get, going back to square one the whole reason we started and got out of research is because you just start hitting all the research barriers there's only so much research you can do mm -hmm. and if you're not allowed to apply that, it yeah the same limitations are on the research that are on the industry like trying to get ethical approval, trying to get funding, trying to get anything move forward in a cannabis related field is also extremely difficult in the UK. Mm -hmm. Explain it like early on, if you were trying to do, well, research that we were doing, I mean, to different bits of tissue and gut tumors, col colorectal cancer tumors, things like that, people didn't even know what I was talking about. Oh, you're growing cannabis in the lab and giving it to cancer patients. Oh, you can't do that endocannabinoid system i'm a consultant i would have heard of that you're talking nonsense boy and just like people don't want to know or don't want to even consider for a moment they don't know everything and if they don't know it it's very easily dismissed because you just don't know what you don't know but um ultimately that knowledge is incredibly powerful and can do wonderful things but mm -hmm. again people know that that that's there and so people want to get in the way of it and i say keep saying people there's just different perspectives i'm sort of balancing but mm -hmm. for the most part i like to think um the world is a positive forward thinking moving forward sort of place where we do want to develop and improve the world so the science is there to be utilized but you just got to make sure that people are ready to accept it and again like we're using science through this computer, through these microphones. Like all of this is the basis of science. It's just not. It's just technologies, I guess, more tangible than medical research. But it, medical research, you don't need it until it's sort you of too it. late um, for a lot of the time. So it's there as a preemptive guide because we know disease is going to come. We know if we know how disease is going to work, <clears throat> we've got a future plan for solving them. And again, that knowledge is incredibly powerful if it's in the hands of people and again being applied in the right way so well if there was rec um, recommended fucking investment into um, prevention of say uh, some sort of diseases that we might be dealing with fucking now after experts have warned them for fucking was it five ten fucking years to be prepared for yeah. this shit and mm. then they and then when they fucking they're standing fucking side by side and they're still fucking ignored no your grand lads everybody be all right for christmas fuck me it doesn't it doesn't fill you with confidence does it well, good point as well then, Maka. The politicization then of science and politics and science just don't mix. But um, again, open conversations, open debates. You can pretty easily cut through that. And um, I think we're probably seeing as strong an example as any with regards to COVID and science and mm -hmm. different perspectives of how that's interpreted. And again, ways that that conversation and debate could be improved as well maybe aren't all being explored but there's just so much again like this what we see in cannabis industry translates into so many different um areas of life and mm -hmm. walks of life as well and i think we've touched on some very uh some solid themes that seem to be resonating in terms of sort of more science needed more debate more community and a bit more unity less well. ego so, less, yeah, less ego. ego less ego Trust less me more we <laughs> yeah, trans transparency. We we've had this with um with a few guests where we spoke of yeah that it is the same thing because of the part of the legislation, part of the culture, and part of the greed because of the financial motive. You've ended up with the nuanced 
breakup of all of the industries that make up as a whole the illicit and illicit, for lack of a better way of describing it, cannabis industry. And I think the sooner that we can all come together and have a conversation, we can recognize that the profit is limitless, the potential is limitless. If we can get the politics out of this and the moralizing away from it, we're going to make some real fucking impact and some real change in the world. Um, so I've only got one more question for you because I'm quite aware that uh, Mr. Maga needs to go for a pressing one, engagement. One, one yes. Uh, so it's a final question. I've just realized we didn't warn you. Second guess Ooh. in a row I haven't warned. This is um, a question that me and Matt came up as a way to have a light hearted end because sometimes these conversations yeah. obviously get quite woof. Hit me with it. Hit me is, with it. Um, 2020 has been a shit year. So what has been something good for you? What um, what's, what can you sort of say to the people that is some of the Ooh, you okay, found man. genuine joy or that is genuine happiness this year? It's been a little happiness, you know what I mean? Oh, well, I've been doing some reflecting on that myself not too recently, so it's funny timing. But for me and from what I've seen from this year, I've seen a lot of people go from chasing things and being upset about the things they don't have to people being more grateful for what they do have. I think when you re when you don't have all your freedoms, you're a lot more grateful for what you do have. But also, um, I think that time and this sort of isolation times helped a lot of people think outside their usual parameters and look at the world in a new way when they've seen how society can be so easily shaken up i think we forget that this could all end tomorrow and um we're all mortal at the end of the day and i think this is like this covid period pointed out more than any for people like well we can all die the world can just stop turning people can just flip the off switch on the world and everything stands to a comes to a halt so um make the most out of every moment and cherish the people that you do have around you as well and i've got to say we've been very fortunate this year that we've met yeah, some incredibly like-minded people. And um, again, I've obviously probably painted a pretty stark <laughs> vision of the cannabis industry, but there's loads of lovely people there. It's a wonderful um, group. There's a lot of people that want to do well, and there's so much opportunity there as well. And um, I want to make sure that we carry forward all of the wonderful um, lessons and um, also conversations as well that we've sort of been involved in and making sure as well that everyone gets to sort of share in that mm. um abundance i guess because there's just so much there and i hate to see people fighting over scraps when there's just like look 90 degrees to your right you've got so much more that you could be doing you, you wouldn't even need to be worrying about all these other people so um yeah i've just got to say yeah that's probably been what i've taken away from it and what i've enjoyed the most this year is just sort of um spending more time with me and more time on your own and just people like yeah it helps you i think stop living on that social ladder who uh, going to different events oh, i've got to go see so and so this week i'm going for drinks on friday and like yeah. that's all fluff the important mm -hmm. stuff sort of already yeah. around you and that's essential i guess yeah you everything get else is sort of non-essential so uh, i guess everyone's found out what's important this year and what um we found out what's important as well and again people mm -hmm. and having a great community around is super super important and um again communities unity all that sort of stuff let more more we less me um yeah. that's what we <laughs> want to sort of bring and carry on into 2021 and uh, into the next five, 10, 20 years down the line as well for the cannabis industry. That's that's what that's what's waiting for us. It's a yeah. wonderful, positive place, and um, yeah, I think we'll all get to the the other side and the bright side eventually at some point. But it's, uh, yeah, obviously being a bumpy year, but um, we shall overcome. Plenty to come. Yeah, exactly. Nice yeah. one, mate. All right. Uh, perfect. So we will wrap that up, guys. You can check out uh, Chris's work at globalcannabinoidsolutions.co.uk. Uh, we will put links to the Facebook page, to the website, and where you can get the handy downloadable guide wherever Mac's finger is pointing. Somewhere around here. Somewhere in this general direction. <laughs> uh, so, Chris, it has been a pleasure. Thank you very much for no, taking the time. Also, to do this. 
best shirt that we've seen on the podcast so far. Well, yeah. I got so bored of seeing grey weather it raining. I thought I'd spice uh, it up a bit yeah. with a nice bowl. Grey and black is all my seven simple fucking wear. That's yeah. that's yeah. a shirt, mate. Awesome. He's yeah. got some nice. He's got some nice uh, art in the background. So, I, yeah, yeah, it's, it's got, oh, yeah. You can see. You can see it's Christmas. My my girlfriend has put Christmassy things everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Tinsel. Um, so yeah, thanks as always, guys, for listening. We will be back in a couple of weeks. Uh, we, yeah, we'll yeah, ho- yeah. Ho- hopefully, we will have a, an episode next week. We're going to try our best yeah. too. If not, we'll see you in the new year. But more, yeah. more it, than likely, we'll see you next week. Yeah. Either way, have a wonderful Christmas. If you feel generous, do check out patreon.com forward slash the simple life and help us fund this wonderful vision and dream. All right, it's been a pleasure, gentlemen. I will catch you all Merry on Christmas. the flip side. Merry Christmas, folks. Peace. All the best, guys. Bye.